next on Unsolved Mysteries. In Tijuana, Mexico, a young film student mysteriously disappears and is found dead. They're young, they're in love, and they rob banks. Meet a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde. It was a harrowing, near-death experience and became one man's journey to the depths of hell. And it had everything you need for the perfect crime, a foolproof plan, $3 million, and a private jet for a quick getaway. Join me for these fascinating stories, plus updates on cases solved by you. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. recently profiled the brazen escape of an accused killer named Albert Leon Fletcher. Fletcher was a career criminal who had been awaiting trial in Florida on multiple charges, including first-degree murder. The killing capped a wild 24-hour rampage by Fletcher and his cousin, Douglas Porter. Give me your money, come on, give me the wallet. Give me your wallet. The victim was 32-year-old Nelson Medina. He left behind a wife and two young children. A few hours later, police arrested Albert Fletcher and Douglas Porter. Porter was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison, but Fletcher escaped before he can be brought to trial and was on the run for more than a year. Update. On the night of our broadcast, an alert viewer recognized Albert Fletcher as one of her neighbors. Soon after, Fletcher was arrested at a trailer park in Delaware, where he was living since his escape. I received a telephone call from the authorities in Delaware advising me uh, that they knew the whereabouts of Albert Leon Fledger. I sent a bulletin to Delaware, and this was around 3 o'clock that afternoon, and about uh, 3.30 or 4 o'clock, they had him apprehended. Albert Leon Fletcher was returned to Florida, where he was convicted of first-degree murder. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Douglas Porter, he served his time and has been released. Bend, Oregon. It was a typical day at Klamath First Federal Bank. Nothing unusual until now. took control and, and he he scared us, he intimidated us. I'll freaking kill you, lady. Your key. Shut up. You lock the front door. Move it! You better hope he doesn't push a button because you're the one who's gonna kill. There was no thought in anybody's mind of trying to um, set an alarm off. <laughs> so he made us all go in to the vault and then he had me fill the bags. After I was done doing that, he told me to go over and get on my knees, and he tied me up. I was scared, I was terrified at that point because I thought, he's gonna shoot us all. Coming out, are we clear? It's all clear. Four years, 12 banks, over a half a million dollars. That's the track record of two outlaw lovers named Craig Pritchard and Nova Guthrie. There's no wonder why some see them as today's Bonnie and Clyde. Craig Pritchard once seemed destined for athletic stardom, but when his baseball career fizzled, Pritchard headed for the bright lights of Las Vegas. There, he found a new passion, 
robbing banks. No one knows exactly how many robberies Pritchard committed before his luck ran out. After a bank teller identified him in a lineup, he was sentenced to five years in an Arizona penitentiary. But rather than learning from his mistakes, Pritchard spent his time behind bars correcting them. Five years is a long time to spend in prison. And he met other people that had robbed banks. And from past experience of cases I've worked, uh, they exchanged thoughts, ideas. He actually learned how to commit bank robberies uh, in, in a better way than he had uh, previously. After his release, Pritchard wound up in New Mexico. And that's where he met 24-year-old Nova Guthrie. They did have dinner, and they hit it off. <laughs> Sparks were flying. Uh, they were very mutually attracted to each other. I'll take you out. I think I could stay a couple of more days. And uh, within a week or so, uh, Craig had moved in with Nova. After meeting, they went on a bank robbery spree, and that included the states of Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Washington, Oregon, across the South and Northwest. Let's go, come on! Pritchard would enter the bank wearing a disguise. He was always armed with an assault weapon. He had a police scanner, so he could monitor any of the police in the area. All right, we're in. Nova always stayed outside the bank, alerting Craig to any dangers via radio. After each robbery, they drove to a predetermined location, abandoned their getaway car, and fled in a second vehicle, their stash car. They're kind of natural-born rule breakers. They, they love a challenge. And what's more thrilling than robbing a bank in broad daylight? And my guess is that after these robberies, you know, it's, it's into bed. It's a thrill. It's exciting. They just want to keep the thrill going. In between the robberies, uh, there were sightings of them really uh, leading a very lavish lifestyle. They liked frequent nice places, the ski resorts, uh, ocean resort areas. They um, look like a very nice, normal couple. There is nothing that's going to stand out that is going to make them different from others. Two years into their crime spree, Craig and Nova took a big risk by visiting Nova's family in Phoenix. Now, at the time, only Craig was a wanted fugitive. The FBI had no evidence linking Nova to the robberies. But Nova's family knew the truth. They blamed Craig for enticing Nova into a life of crime. Hey, Craig. Beer? Nah. I just want to talk to you outside for a minute. Nova's brother confronted Craig. What's going on? You're leaving right now. You're going to get in your fancy little car. He didn't like what he had done and what he had gotten over involved with. Go. And he didn't want her to be any part of Nova's life. Nova, he's gone. Without Craig, Nova, he's gone. Nova didn't know what to do next. Nova was confused and embarrassed. She went along with her sister to meet secretly with a police chaplain, William Fay. So what is it you want to tell me? I think deep in her heart, she wanted to be forgiven, but didn't know how to go about it. And at that point, I took my Bible, and I began to share scripture with her. I said, what do you think it is now that God would have you do? Nova said, turn myself in. I said, let's go. Nova provided information regarding her involvement in the bank robberies and just the manner in which they were committed. We didn't arrest Nova at that point in time because we had not done any investigation to corroborate her story, and we had insufficient probable cause to have the United States Attorney's Office authorized on an arrest warrant. Once they flipped Nova, the FBI was confident that they could track down Pritchard. Nova, however, was having second thoughts. Not long after she agreed to cooperate, Nova Guthrie abruptly disappeared back into a life of crime with Craig Pritchard. When she first went with Craig, she didn't quite realize what a big decision she had made. She had second thoughts about it, stepped back from the brink, and then realized, it's boring back here. I'm going back to the brink. And that's what she did. Oh, 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 oh. 
kill you, lady. Just because they haven't used their weapons doesn't mean that people aren't getting hurt. You take a look at the victims and the victim tellers uh, specifically, it's very traumatic for them. You know, I'd like to tie him up and stick a gun in his face. I'd like to have him feel that same helpless feeling, being terrified for your life, thinking that you're going to die. Update. Cape Town, South Africa. Nova Guthrie and Craig Pritchard were finally captured 10,000 miles from Nova's home in Phoenix. Guthrie managed a nightclub, and Pritchard bought and sold stocks over the internet. Then, a South African tourist traveling in the United States recognized Guthrie from a wanted poster and contacted authorities. After being extradited to the United States, Craig Pritchard was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. Nova Guthrie received a 10-year sentence, served her time, and has been released. Next, a near-death experience takes one man on a terrifying journey to hell and back. Paris, France. Sometimes the incredible occurs when you least expect it. Just ask Howard Storm, a professor and an accomplished artist. Near the end of a three-week European uh, tour, the, uh, Howard and his uh, wife Beverly were in Paris when disaster struck. Howard, are you okay? Uh, oh. oh my God, uh, Howard, uh, what's the matter? Uh, oh, careful. Geez. I was just hurt. I thought I'd been shot. And it was the most searing, excruciating pain in the center of my abdomen. I was just panicked and full of fear. I, I couldn't think at all. The doctor that came to the hotel and the two doctors that examined me in the emergency room at the hospital all said the same thing, that this was a very critical situation and that if I didn't have the surgery within an hour, I would die. Howard's small intestine had ruptured. He was transferred to another hospital where the staff spoke only French. Now, there were problems finding a surgeon. They didn't give me any medication whatsoever, no treatment whatsoever, and I was beginning to fear that I wasn't going to make it after a few hours. After six or seven hours, I had a very strong feeling that I wasn't going to make it, and after um, 10 hours, I knew I wasn't going to make it. Howard says that as he lost consciousness, he fell into a bizarre, altered reality, one that would change him forever. Howard Storm had what is called a near-death experience. Most of the time, these episodes are described as a glimpse into heaven. But for Howard Storm, it was very different. His near-death experience took him straight to the depths of hell. By his own admission, Howard Storm was a man with a dark side. He commanded everyone around him with angry passion. My wife and my children feared me. Sometimes I was fun, sometimes I was good, but I also used a lot of threats. I used a lot of rage. I used a lot of coercion to get my way. That was, that was the bottom line all the time, was to get my way, my will to prevail. Please, that one. As he slipped closer to death in that Paris hospital room, Howard says that he took the first step on a terrifying journey. <laughs> I looked at the bed and I saw myself lying in the bed. And this horrified me because I knew that that's not possible. Because I didn't believe in life after death, I didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in heaven or hell. And I mean, I really didn't believe. It's me. <laughs> I heard people calling me from outside the room, and they were saying, Howard, Howard, hurry up. You've got to come with us. It's time now. Howard, Howard, it's time. Come with me. It's time. I assumed that they must be hospital personnel come to take me to have my surgery. Where's my doctor? And they didn't deny that, although they didn't confirm it either. 
As I walked with these people, I became increasingly aware that something was very wrong. Nobody wants to help me. Be quiet. And these people were getting more and more aggressive and cruel to me. Don't stop, Howard. Just keep going. We have to move along, Howard. All I wanted to do now was to get away from them. It was getting darker and darker. And they kept leading me on, standing in a circle around me, and there was really no way to escape from them. And they were scratching and pushing and pulling at me and began biting at me. And so I was starting to yell and scream and howl with pain. And they thought that was real funny. And they really liked that a lot. And that the more that they did, the better they liked it. In that place, I heard a voice, which sounded like my voice, say, pray to God. And I didn't believe in God. I said a second time, pray to God. And I tried to remember how to pray. The mention of God pushed them away from me, pushed them back and back into the darkness. So I just kept at it and kept at it. It's as if it burned them. They simply retreated into the darkness and were gone. And I was all alone in that place. Left in my physical pain, my emotional pain, self-pity, and, and considering my whole life as sort of like, what was the point of ever living to end up like this? I'd never really accomplished anything very significant. Now I end up in this place of torment. Why was I ever born? And in that complete despair, pain and hopelessness. A small light appeared and got brighter and brighter and brighter. And I felt this brightness reach down and pick me up. And I was all healed and whole and full of the most wonderful physical ecstasy. And he called a number of angels around us. And they showed me the effects that I had on other people, how I'd hurt other people. And I think to myself, I'm scum. I don't belong here, they've made a mistake. And then for the first time, he spoke to me and said, we don't make mistakes, you do belong here. The mysterious figure then instructed Howard to return to Earth and to live with love in his heart. I can't. I can't. <laughs> Soon after Howard regained consciousness, a surgeon arrived. The operation saved Howard's life. He would eventually make a full recovery, and he would also undergo a dramatic transformation. Lift up your hearts. Let us pray. Today, Howard is an ordained minister and active in missionary work. He is determined to make the most of his second chance at life. There's no doubt in my mind that I went to hell. I know what I experienced, and I know it wasn't a dream, and I know that there is a conscious existence beyond this world. If you want to call it another dimension, or you want to call it the supernatural world, or you want to call it heaven and hell, there is a life beyond this life, and we will reap the reward or suffer the consequence of what we've done with this life. Next, three million dollars and a private jet, the perfect setup for the perfect crime. It was a masterful plan that baffled the police and the FBI and involved a beautiful young woman, a convicted killer, and three million dollars in cash. Las Vegas, Nevada. The city where gamblers risk it all for a chance at a big score. 21 year old Heather Tallchief seemed like any other young woman trying to make a start. But Heather had a much bigger plan. She was going to get rich and quick. On Friday, October 1st, Heather was working as a driver for the Loomis Armored Car Company. Radio check, Route 3, arriving at drop off number one. She and her two co-workers were responsible for filling the ATMs of several local casinos with cash. Uh, 125, 150. The van was loaded with over $3 million in preparation for a busy weekend. Heather would 
drive to the back portion of the casino and drop us off. The final ATM was near the casino's side entrance. Now standard procedure called for Heather to meet the other guards there and to pick them up. When my partner and I exited the casino, we did not see the van anywhere. We assumed that maybe she got lost, that she was stuck in traffic. We didn't know. So I, in joking, suggested that she might have taken the vehicle. But later, a check of the surveillance camera showed Heather simply drove away from the casino and never returned. And that she and the money disappeared. Heather Tall Chief applied for the job with the Armored Car Company approximately two months before the robbery. And the investigation has led us to believe that this entire event from the moment of applying for the job to the robbery was all planned in advance for the sole purpose of committing this crime. Heather Tall Chief had once worked as a volunteer nurse, and she had no criminal record. So why would she commit such an audacious crime? As police combed through her apartment, answers began to surface. Two distinct sets of fingerprints were found. Heather had not acted alone. The prints were identified as those of a convicted murderer, Roberto Solis. Solis had a record. He had shot and killed an armored car guard during an unsuccessful robbery. Tall Chief and Solis met in San Francisco, where they began a relationship and subsequently planned this crime. Yeah, take a look at this. With 48-year-old Solis and 21-year-old Heather, masterminds of one of the biggest armored car robberies in history? Or was Solis manipulating the young and impressionable Tall Chief to finally make his big score? However it was planned, the crime and their getaway went off without a hitch. It'll work, trust me. <laughs> Two hours after Heather and the armored car disappeared from the casino, an unusual couple arrived at a small local airport. They had chartered a private jet to Denver, Colorado. Solis looked like an older gentleman, a doctor, a tall chief, like a sickly, uh, invalid, older lady. So only three small suitcases were taken. If you had a million dollars or three million dollars, it would take approximately eight to 10 suitcases to transport that much money. We surmise that they must have shipped the money on ahead. Three days later, the FBI traced Heather and Solis to Denver. But by then it was too late. Denver had only been a stopover. Clues seemed to lead in all directions. Florida, the Caribbean, Central and South America. It seemed the couple had covered their tracks well, and the FBI had no solid leads. Two weeks later, investigators discovered the armored van in a commercial building Solis had rented for a phony business. Inside the building were packing materials. They confirmed the FBI's suspicions that the money had been shipped to some unknown destination. He told everybody he was starting a new business. Solace opened this business under the guise of retrofitting vehicles to be used as armored car vehicles. In that manner, it didn't draw any attention to the other people in the area when a real armored vehicle was brought into the facility. The FBI had nowhere to turn. Had Tall Chief and Solis actually committed the perfect crime? I think that it was well thought out, well conceived, and well executed. But crime doesn't pay, and I don't think it's a perfect crime. I think that we'll still get them. The trail went cold. Law enforcement can find no trace of Heather Tall Chief or Roberto Solis. That is, until 12 years later, when Heather appeared at the Las Vegas courthouse and turned herself in. Heather claimed that she had been brainwashed by Solis and only committed the crime because she feared for her life. She left Solis when she learned that she was pregnant with his child. I believe he uh, manipulated and influenced my mind for his own means. She said she turned herself in to give her 10-year-old son a chance at a normal life. I'm doing this for him. I can um, give him a better life, one that he deserves. 
After 12 years in hiding, Heather was sentenced to 63 months in prison. When the judge read her verdict, she told reporters that at last she felt free. You get tired. You get very tired of running. If you're living in a prison mentally, then what is a, a box, a room, or restricted privileges? It's nothing compared to what I've already been through. Heather Tallchief served her time and has been released. Roberto Solis is still at large. If you recognize this man and know where he might be, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a young college student is found in a Mexican morgue. Was it an accident or murder? Tijuana, Mexico. They call it Avenida Internacional. This stretch of highway separates Tijuana from the states. Dozens of people die here every year, most while trying to enter the U.S. illegally. <laughs> On the night of May 5th, the scene facing local rescue crews was all too familiar. The pedestrian was barely alive. He carried no ID and was classified as desconocito, or unknown. He died six days after the accident without regaining consciousness. Another 15 days would pass before he was identified as 22-year-old Patrick Kelly, a film student at the University of Southern California. During Patrick's absence, his mother launched a desperate search to find him. Terry Kelly's investigation uncovered compelling evidence that her son's death was much more than just a random traffic accident. Patrick Kelly always had a passion for writing and storytelling. By the time he went to college, Patrick knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to make movies. How many times have you seen this film? Eight or nine times. Eight or nine times. On a Friday night near the end of his junior year, Patrick was celebrating with a close friend, Michael Park. After months of intense effort, Patrick had just turned in his year-end project, a full-length motion picture script. He was really upbeat. He was just really anxious to get on with his senior year and then, you know, hopefully get out in Hollywood. We watched the, the video for about 45 minutes, about 3.45. Um, I remember the time because uh, I had to get up pretty early the next morning. And that was the last I saw him. One of the things we agreed on when he first went away to school was that we would always call each other on Sunday evening. In three years, he'd never missed the call. Uh, he didn't call that Sunday night, and I called him and tried all the evening to get hold of him. Uh, so I knew right away that we had a problem. Terry asked Michael Park to go to Patrick's room. It seemed as if Patrick had just stepped out for a moment. His wallet was on the desk, his bags and his clothes were in the closet. And yet, his passport was nowhere to be found. Only the answering machine offered a possible clue. Hello, Patrick. This is Julia with Founders National Bank. Please give us a call. Thank you. Terry Kelly immediately phoned the bank. There had been several ATM transactions over that weekend in Mexico that had overdrew his account. So that was the first clue we had as to what direction he had been headed. And that direction was due south. At 1024 Saturday morning, Patrick made a $60 withdrawal at a 7-Eleven in San Clemente. 63 miles from Los Angeles. At 6.08 p.m., another $135 was withdrawn at an ATM in the Tijuana tourist area. The next day, three more withdrawals at ATMs in downtown Tijuana bled Patrick's account dry. Terry Kelly hired private detective Doug Roth to find Patrick. Roth began at the 7-Eleven in San Clemente. The surveillance tape from Saturday morning showed Patrick entering the store. These are the last known pictures of Patrick before his death. He acted normally. There was no indication of trouble. Roth continued south to Mexico. At the border, 
he decided to check the parking lots where many tourists leave their cars before entering Tijuana. Roth had pay dirt right away. It's a uh, Honda Civic Maroon. Uh, this car has been here for 16 days, sir. Patrick's car was parked along the back fence. It was caked with mud. There was damage to the right front bumper and the rear license plate was loose. Worse, it looked to Doug like someone other than Patrick had last driven the car. The driver's seat was much closer to the steering wheel than would be consistent with someone who was six foot one inches tall. The radio was turned to a uh, Spanish American radio station, which was, as we understand it, inconsistent with Patrick's listening habits. But we also had found a partially smoked cigarette in the ashtray of the car. Patrick was not a smoker and, uh, as we understand it, did not allow smoking in his car. You asked about pictures you could show around Tijuana. Okay. There's, uh, the leads uncovered at the parking lot led Roth to the Tijuana morgue and the body of the unidentified pedestrian. Terry Kelly rushed to Mexico, fearing the worst. It was, it was a very tough thing. They don't, they don't let you in the same room with them. You have to view them through glass. And a, you know, a considerable a distance for, for those circumstances. But uh, I, I, you know, I knew it was him. But how exactly did Patrick Kelly die? Here's what we know. At approximately 1 a.m. on May 5th, a motorcyclist was heading east along the Avenida Internacional. Two pedestrians suddenly darted out in front. Patrick never had a chance to tell anyone what happened. He was unconscious when paramedics arrived. Mexican authorities would later attribute all of Patrick's injuries to the accident. Doug Roth didn't see it that way. My initial reaction upon viewing the body was that he had been beaten severely. This is based principally on my observation of wounds about the face and upper body, chest area. An independent autopsy commissioned by Terry Kelly seemed to agree. The report concluded, quote, findings do not support an interpretation that death was due to a motor vehicle accident. The hours after the accident were also marked by irregularities. While Patrick lay dying in the hospital, someone used his ATM card in downtown Tijuana, making not one, but three cash withdrawals. The evidence clearly indicates that transactions had occurred after he was comatose in Mexico with his ATM card, that that ATM card had been used with a PIN number which he would not have reasonably given up or had any need to have written down anywhere. The evidence of foul play was mounting. The autopsy, the ATM withdrawals, and finally, Patrick's car. According to the parking lot records, someone paid the $60 fee and drove the car off the lot four days after Patrick died. The next day, the car was returned to the same parking space. I believe Patrick went to Mexico with another individual. And I believe that by five o'clock in the afternoon, they had met with some unsavory characters and had probably been taken against their will hostage, had been beaten, uh, that their PIN number had been gained, and likely while they were held nearby that place where the accident occurred, they made a break for it. One of them was struck. One of them was not. One of them made it away. Was Patrick Kelly with a friend when he was run down in Tijuana? Perhaps someone watching knows the answers. If you have any information that might help solve this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, he may not have a badge, but this bloodhound is as dedicated as any police officer on the street.
Denver, Colorado. Looking for a little girl, sir. Uh, it was a race against time. Police in Inglewood, Colorado, a Denver suburb, searched door to door for five-year-old Allie Borelli's. Allie was last seen playing in the courtyard of the apartment complex where she lived. Her babysitter went inside for just a few minutes, but by the time she came back, Allie was gone. The search dragged on for four days without a single clue. And then finally, the police turned to an age-old crime-fighting tool. Meet Yogi, the bloodhound. When it comes to tracking missing persons or criminals, he's one of the best. And as you're about to see, nothing beats the remarkable nose of a bloodhound. I had never been exposed to the bloodhounds and the work that they do. And it was, it was certainly something, anything we could try to do to find this little girl. With news cameras rolling, the bloodhound and his handler, canine officer Jerry Nickel, went to work. The dog took Allie's scent from clothing she had recently worn and then started moving. Here you go. Where'd he go, buddy? Go get him. Come on. First, he went up the stairs, zeroing in on a single apartment. It was Allie's home, and it was a good sign. Yogi was on the right track. I was watching the dog work. I wanted to have hope that this bloodhound would be able to find our granddaughter. There was a, a sort of comfort that I felt because I felt now they're going to find her. Where is he? Let's go. Yogi, where'd he go? Yogi led Jerry out of the apartment complex and south down the street. The media crush followed close behind, recording every move. The dog paid no attention at all. He didn't care. He was oblivious to everything other than what he was doing because he's happy doing that. Where is it? Come on. Well, the bloodhound is by instinct a tracker, by nature. It's something they, they're bred to do and they live to do. Their sense of smell is just incredible. The loose skin around the face it just acts as a place for the scent to be attracted to, the skin folds. The slobbering is the moisture that the dog is emitting will actually help enhance that scent around his face and those long, dangling, floppy ears, it kind of stirs it up in front of him. A scent trail, whether animal or human, comes from thousands of dead skin cells that are constantly being shed. Unless those cells are swept away by severe weather, the scent could remain clear for up to a month. When a dog is introduced a specific scent to track, he basically focuses on that scent and forgets and ignores the rest. As the hound followed Allie's scent, Jerry quickly recognized that his canine partner was working a familiar pattern. If a person's walking on foot, the scent's a little bit stronger, and they're going to stay by the sidewalk. But he is working wide between the street and between the fronts of businesses. And he's still picking it up on the fringes. And seeing him do that before, it just in my mind, he was working a car. Unbelievable as it seems, we leave scent trails even from moving cars. The skin cells shoot out through the car's ventilation and exhaust systems, and then they're deposited on the side of the road. This is an easy pickup for the nose of a bloodhound. We've even done scenarios in training where we'll put a person in a trunk that's sealed up, and they still can pick it up. His world is his nose. Yogi was relentless. He tracked south for several miles, covering almost 40 city blocks. At the entrance to a freeway, he headed straight up the westbound ramp. I was very skeptical that that dog was doing anything other than going for a walk. But when he took that first ramp to I-470 and did so with so much confidence, then I started to wonder, you know, maybe the dog is really onto something here. Let's go. Come on, buddy. The search party drove west to the next exit. Would the scent trail lead the dog further down the freeway or up the exit ramp? Go, leave it. Where is he? Come on. And sure enough, he kept on working, and he went past it. So then we'd load him up, go to the next exit, and we did the same thing several times. To speed up the search, police skipped the fourth exit and moved on to the fifth. Yogi made it quite clear they overshot the mark. The scent was gone. He doesn't have it here. We're going to have to get back on the other side. We've had everything going westbound up to here. Now it's not here. Come on. They backtracked to the on? previous exit. 
the hound again picked up the scent. But this time, he led the search party off the freeway toward a wooded area called Deer Creek Canyon. The canyon is located here, southwest of the apartment complex where Allie disappeared. By now, Yogi had been tracking Allie all over city streets, parking lots, and freeways for more than seven hours. He had covered nearly 14 miles. Come on, pick it up, I know you're hot, come on. Let's go. He was slowing down a little bit, the tongue was really dragging, and he's really slobbering, and I could tell he was getting hot. A hound has a drive, unfortunately, they will run themselves to death. If they get tired, they don't care. They don't Come stop. Come on. That's a boy. Come on. The dog's strength was failing. Still, he wouldn't abandon the search. Oh, good dog. Come on. Reluctantly, Jerry made the decision for him. He basically uh, kept looking at me as to why are we stopping. Come on. Come on. I'm not ready to stop. I want to keep going. This is my track. I want to get there. Let's go. Up. With Yogi sidelined, human volunteers picked up the search. It wasn't long before they knew why Yogi had refused to quit. Allie's body was found less than two miles from the point where the dog had been forced to stop. Without Yogi's persistence, Allie's body would never have been discovered. I think at first that didn't sink in because I was pretty upset at the fact that Allie was found dead. To end up where he did, uh, it just, yeah, I was totally amazed. These dogs have a purpose in law enforcement. I mean, we're here out here working for the communities and the citizens, and they really have done some amazing things for us. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. Allie's murder has been solved 18 years later. The killer was a neighbor, Nick Stouffer. His DNA samples match those found on Allie's remains. Stouffer died in 2001, and this case has been closed.